David has a significant and extensive experience in broadcasting Aboriginal community development and Aboriginal education. Holding significant executive roles, including the Chief Executive Department of State Aboriginal Affairs, David has contributed across a range of government roles to further Aboriginal education and community welfare. David is a member, a board member of the South Australian Museum and the chair of the Aboriginal Advisory Committee, South Australian Museum. Tonight, David will speak on the topic of storytelling, culture, truth telling and the arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David to the stage. Thank you, Shane. One of the things that I want to just say about education, I see a number of very important ap academics in our midst here, Aboriginal academics. When you go back to the 1970s, there weren't any. And there are many now who have graced our universities with a, pers a perspective which wasn't there 30 or 40 years ago. And I'm often talking to Professor Buckskin about this, that we need to celebrate the fact that we have some fine Aboriginal academics. And we ought to be pleased that our community has those people in our midst. But I'd like to start by saying, Jack, thank you for changing the intro. We've got a different story tonight. And Jack Buckskin welcomed us to Ghana country and we acknowledge the Ghana people. I'd like to particularly acknowledge Lewis O'Brien who is a great champion of his people's language and if you go back to the beginnings of the work on revitalising Ghana language, Lewis was at the forefront of that work and I'm particularly pleased to have you here tonight Lewis, thank you for coming. Loach O'Donoghue is an extraordinary lady. She is truly a treasure. But I remember going on my first trip, uh, Greg Crafter recruited me into Aboriginal Affairs. I didn't know what I was getting into. I th think I'd prefer Greg maybe to have stayed in TAFE, but you got me to come. And Loach O'Donoghue was in Canberra and a group of us went to Canberra and she said, what are you boys doing here? And I said, well, we, we actually work for the South Australian Government. She said, well, look, I don't want you boys doing anything that's going to embarrass me. So I want you to behave yourselves while you're here. Now, if you've been on the end of Loach's comments in those terms, you make sure that you behave yourself, which we did do. But she is an extraordinary lady and I'm pleased to have known her. I'd also like to acknowledge the Premier of South Australia and uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and other distinguished guests. Importantly to acknowledge all Elders, whether you're from our community or from the wider community, welcome and thank you for coming this evening. And all of you that are seated in the hall this evening, I never thought that a a little black fella from, well, I'm not little anymore, from Port Augusta would actually end up in this great hall in the University of Adelaide. And I'm truly honoured, Loacher, that you've given me this opportunity. The heart of Australia's footprint in the world that we live in is the cultural history and the presence of the oldest and longest living culture in the world. 60,000 years, and now the Victorians have found that it's a potential that's 120,000 years of Aboriginal occupation. Now, you'll have to excuse me because I've got a bit of a lurgy that's been going around. Have you got it? Beware. <laughs> 
It's my intention to speak about scene setting, intent, relationship, partnership, mutual respect and unity. But first of all, I want to take a moment to thank many people who've worked to preserve cultural heritage of our people. Worked in the arts, Aboriginal cultural groups, the custodians of language and country, the scientists, the historians, writers and researchers who've worked in the universities, in the libraries, the art gallery, the South Australian Museum, the History Trust and State Records. When the government announced that it was going to build a centre for Aboriginal culture and the arts, it was an exciting announcement because we thought here's a great opportunity to unite our community and to unite all South Australians. So with the help of the native title groups, members of the Museum Aboriginal Advisory Committee, Tandanya, North Terrace Institutions, supported by the ILC and Native Title Unit, we work to constructively support a vision that we hope the Premier will bring together for this great centre on Lot 14. Because what we want to see is a true representation of Aboriginal people's culture through history, storytelling, and the story of country, both arts in the visual and performing sense, and to make sure that our huge array of artefacts come to life in a place that's respectful of our past, but also contains a strong element that gives Aboriginal people, young and old, great confidence going forward. We've said, it will be a place devoted to Australian Aboriginal cultures, truth-telling, art, history, science and contemporary life. A living, breathing cultural experience. It must recognise and celebrate the longest continuous human culture on the planet, provide a very dynamic cultural and economic hub and be a beacon of reconciliation for generations to come. The Aboriginal people have cared and respected this country for over, as I said, 60,000 years, now potentially 120,000 years. We were not nomads, we were not wanderers, we had very settled communities. Imagine if you were in Southport why would you go wandering all over the countryside when you had the best fishing, the lovely environment in which to live? And Aboriginal people stayed put. This was a myth. The nomadic concept was a myth portrayed by British colonists and, unfortunately, continued by many academics today. And one of the things about our people was that they connected with all that was in their midst. Our stories meant something in terms of the connection with country and the universe. This was a rich place with diverse landscapes that offered security and an abundance of food sources, knowledge was passed from generation to generation to look after this great land. I recall an old man saying to me once, the land owns us, we don't own it. You know why? Because we're just passing through. Just think about that. Western culture still believes it can conquer the earth. May I tell you, the earth will conquer Western society if it's not careful. Australia is often dismissive 
of the dispossession of Aboriginal lands. The Lutheran missionaries observed of the great Ghana community that their community arrangements were very settled and each tribe has a certain district of the country as property received from their forefathers and the boundaries of which are fixed. These were the earliest observations made by Lutheran missionaries. A lack of sustained government commitment and the continuing loss of arrangements that enabled Aboriginal people to continue the system of Aboriginal governance were ignored. And the arrogance followed the English colonials to treat our people as irrelevant. Aboriginal peoples attempted to build a base of traditional influence to protect the interests of our people, but the authorities thwarted these by dominant power bases and self-interest. This at attitude was actually put in place from the very beginning when the South Australia Act was assented to in England. Now all the South Australians would know the South Australia Act, wouldn't they? Because it's very important. It's damaging to my people, extremely damaging. The South Australia Act of 1834, an act to empower His Majesty to erect South Australia into a British province or provinces and to provide the colonisation and government therefore proclaimed the land of South Australia to be waste and unoccupied lands fit for the purposes of colonisation. We were here in large numbers. A report by the settlement authorities was humiliating for Aboriginal people as it introduced what could be described as a form of slavery. It was demeaning, it was humiliating. The first report of the Colonisation Commission promised with settlement the provision of Aboriginal asylums. Remember what I said about the freedom, the movement, the great abundance of interconnectedness with this country? Now we were going to get a treat, asylums. They would consist of weatherproof sheds where Aboriginal people could receive food and clothing in exchange for labour. It was interesting when I talk about intent. It was interesting the intent of the time made this statement. A promise to seed for the use of Aboriginal people 16 acres of every 80 acre allotment of land sold. Now I said that once to a Premier of South Australia who said to me, if you do that and you ask for a, a repayment going back, you'll send the state broke. That was well before the State Bank, Mr Premier. Um, so this means that the letters patent, which we often refer to, were a nonsense, basically. They were just a charade. And that document of February 19, 1836 also appeared to guarantee the Aboriginal people land rights. That nothing in these our letters patent contained shall affect or be construed to affect any Aboriginal natives of the said province to the actual occupation or enjoyment of their own persons or in the persons of their descendants any of the lands therein now actually occupied or enjoyed by such natives. I was asked by a very good friend of mine, but David, I didn't do this to Aboriginal people. You're probably thinking that right now. My question in response is this. Who are the modern beneficiaries of the South Australia Act? Who are the modern beneficiaries of the letters patent? Is there any Aboriginal person in the room that would put their hand up and say they were? No. Now, 
the European Australians are the beneficiaries of those two events. And generation after generation has benefited from that and continue to do so. Aboriginal people must have a venue for truth-telling about the history of displacement to enable all South Australians to understand their history. Aboriginal people for decade after decade called for Australians to be more open to their history and embrace the story of country, the spiritual and cultural ongoing presence of Aboriginal Australia in their lives. But no, we continued a history of exclusion, a set of demeaning government practices put in place <coughs> excuse me, to create a negative impression of our people. The system considered Aboriginal people as an inconvenience to the business interests of the colonisers. Loach O'Donoghue stood up against ignorance and racism in her time whilst remaining a voice of reason and sensible cooperative progress. She was a woman who faced being apart from her family, but her inner strength allowed her to stare down the barrier makers. And she did it in one very significant event. She wanted to become a nurse, true? And she went to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, but they refused her entry into its training course because of her Aboriginal descent. And she told the State Library in an interview that they said to her, go back to the place where you belong. And she says, I suppose that's when I first really got my blood up. It was completely unjust. I was deeply resentful and determined I wouldn't accept that decision. She joined the Aborigines Advancement League and helped in a campaign which resulted in her being accepted in 1954. 1954. You are still not seen as a valued citizen of your own country. You are still subjected to exclusion. She became one of a number of trainee nurses at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. And we talk so much about this wonderful lady, but she went to have a very distinguished career as a charged sister. So she she did want to become a nurse and her career blossomed. She had a year in Assam, India with the Baptist Overseas Mission and then she joined the Department of Aboriginal Affairs in the late 60s. And then she created another milestone. She became the first Commonwealth Regional Director who was a woman. Amazing achievement. But she never let any of that get on top of her. The same experience that my mother had of part of the stolen generation never allowed it to get on top of them. And so many stolen generation people, I think John Hill found this when he did his inquiry, we are not victims, we are survivors. Remember that, Peter, last year at, at the reconciliation breakfast? These repeated ex very, very clear statements of intent in Aboriginal affairs and across government began at the time of occupation. Remember, we're going to give you some land. Remember, we're going to acknowledge you as living on your land and you can stay there. Intent. But we continue to experience intent devoid of lasting action as an ever-present colonial hangover from a time when commitment to recognise the rights of Aboriginal people was a hollow promise without any substance. The change in the way of life and the control by governments of destiny for our people has caused enormous cultural stress 
a stress which has impacted many generations of Aboriginal people in this state and across the country. Cultural stress to all of you, you need to understand because it refers to an individual's subjective sense of the risk that their ethnic culture could be changed and the resulting concern and worry about the development and survival of his or her ethnic cultural heritage. Cultural stress is a critical issue faced by many people and countries in the process of social transition. Cultural stress as a typical perceived cultural context has impacted on many people around the world. I hear many people talk about racism in Australia towards us as Aboriginal people. I want to put it to you tonight that this is a very systemic anti-Aboriginal sentiment. It's run through the thread of this country but decades after decades. This governance model is often disrupted by good people, individual people from the wider community who realise that their dominant culture was being unreasonable and was culturally bankrupt in treating Aboriginal people so harshly. The story of people working to extend a hand of support matched by their actions is illustrated to me by a very heartwarming story that appeared in all places in the Port Augusta transcontinental newspaper back in 2018. And it was a story about Elsie Jackson, a proud Adyamantna woman. And it went on to say, Elsie went to Nipabana school for only a short time, but it was here that she found her passion. She worked on a voluntary basis as a teacher's aide, educating students about Aboriginal culture and engagement. David Amory, head teacher at the time, recognised the value of Elsie's work and attempted to get her employed in an official capacity with the Department of Education. At the time, there was no Aboriginal people employed within the South Australian education sector. What do you think happened with Mr Amory's request? It was denied. It was denied. Mr Amory valued Elsie's wealth of skills so much and so highly that he paid out of his own salary to employ her for the remainder of the 1966 school year. The following year, Elsie was placed on the Education Department's payroll, making her the first Aboriginal teacher aide to be employed in a state school in South Australia. Not the work of the system, but the goodwill of an individual. And that's the journey many of my colleagues have had time and time again. The goodwill of individuals, not a systemic change. The commitment to Aboriginal people comes from groups or the actions of individuals who've taken the time to build something that's critical, relationship relationship with us as a community and relationship with individual Aboriginal people. The mainstream government departments are generally well represented with reconciliation plans and an array of very bright official rhetoric as it relates to us, but it's all political correctness. And the commitment could actually be measured in a similar way to what I did just recently. I had a flu injection. It's an annual event. And I get that inoculation annually. And most people take reconciliation or NAIDOC week as an annual inoculation, along with their reconciliation plans. And that's where they leave it 
until the Premier says, where is your plan? We better get another jab and put it in our strategic directions. This is a challenge for all of us. The challenge is most Australian departments and businesses are linear. They're task orientated. And if you look across the spectrum of Aboriginal affairs and the way it's been dealt with over many decades, it's a linear approach. It's task orientated. It is not embracing and based on relationship building. Aboriginal culture is based on building relationships, respecting country and the spiritual connection to our ancestors. You've seen that displayed again this evening by Jack Buckskin. Eduardo Duran and Bonnie Duran are Indian American academics who decry the attitude of many in positions of influence. For our profession to believe that solutions come from anywhere but the oppressed communities is akin to professional narcissism. Now those of us who didn't graduate to year 12, Lynn, narcissism for me, I went and looked it up, it's a state in which a person has an inflated sense of their self-importance. And they said it was bordering on imperialism. This narcissism was bordering on imperialism. When you ignore the views and the concerns of Indigenous people. And they said that this narcissistic attitude merely ensures that the current problems continue and eventually the whole society will suffer from such thinking. In my experience over many years in government, there are many pretenders. Pretenders in government are spread across all agencies. Aboriginal people are placed under the Public Works Commissioner, not under flora and fauna in the early days. Public Works Commissioner. It wasn't even the Ministry at that time, it was the Public Works Commissioner in the early days, in the 30s. When asked by a parliamentarian as to why the government had put it under the Public Works Commissioner, the very blunt response was, no one wanted it. I worked some eight ministers. You had to get the impression that no one wanted it because they didn't last that long. Greg, I think you were the longest. And the government later created the Minister for Public Works, which had nothing to give any hope to people that things were going to look up. In the state records, a little flower and a few blankets publication in 1953, it says, the Minister for Works, McIntosh, displayed complacency in relation to Aboriginal education. Oh, there have been one or two cases of half-caste boys coming to Adelaide and entering into apprenticeships. And although they had done well, such cases are really rarities. Because it's hard to turn a nomad into a stool sitter in one generation. All that can be done has been done. The pretenders in the federal parliament dismantled ATSIC and left the Aboriginal people with TLC. Tender loving consultation. <laughs> resulting in little or no commitment to self-determination and self-banishment. I, I could be corrected, but the one recommendation that was never implemented from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody was self-determination and self-banishment. The pretenders in my old Department of Education failed to take seriously the concerns of Aboriginal executives and our advisory leaders about the school targeted Aboriginal student funding being used as general use funding in schools. Because principals need to be in control of their schools. Governing councils need to be in control of their schools. But if they have anti-Aboriginal sentiments, have you checked it out to make sure that they have the capability of representing all children? One million dollars in my time was taken out of 
Aboriginal programs and used for general use. One million dollars. Without even a flinch of concern from my bureaucracy. The pretenders who gathered to implement or defend themselves against the recommendations of the Royal Commission was more a defence. Imagine the police commissioner at the time implemented identification of Aboriginal people as, it, as one of his key initiatives because the government had decided to have identified programs for Aboriginal people. We, we will identify them. And I argued this with him and the Attorney General at the time, but they continued the process. Imagine when you hear the call on the radio that the person was of Aboriginal appearance. Now, I can see a lot of Aboriginals sitting in this room. I cannot see a stock standard appearance. Why do they only call Caucasians of Caucasian appearance? Some Caucasians are quite dark, if you go and check it out, you know, around Turkey and near those regions. I've never heard anyone say that the person was of Irish appearance, or Brian, that they were of English appearance. But they describe us in very clear terms. I am concerned that the Aboriginal deaths in custody has resulted in an appalling increase in the number of people in prisons, and today a very disturbing increase in the number of women who are in jail and the growing number of our children being removed from their families. The cause is cultural poverty, a failure to connect with an Aboriginal perspective and the lack of ability to accept failure and work to improve the working relationship based on mutual respect. The idea Aboriginal people must reach a consensus is beyond belief. You've only got to look at elections in Australia. Are there any consensus? And we've been, we're asking the question, when are you people going to reach a consensus? Because you expect that of us. And if there is a mistake, the response of the powers to be dictate that it won't be tolerated. And it brings Aboriginal self-management structures crashing to the ground. We're not able to establish a power base and an inst institutional structure because of these actions. The idea of self-determination and self-management is something indispensable for Aboriginal people. And for the rest of Australia, using a religious concept here, it's absolution for the system of government and the wider community. Let me turn to art. It's become an important economic tool for many Aboriginal people and the growth of galleries representing Aboriginal artists is an avenue through which people from remote areas can display and sell product to the highly important high market areas in Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide. But it's also important for other artists who don't come from remote areas. But during my time working with the community at Girard, it was an honour to work with a man called Ted Roberts, who you probably never knew of. But Ted was a very important carver. And he went back to country in the north to get good timber, because he said that was the best place he found for timber, because he was from that territory. But Ted was a craftsman, but at the same time he was a small businessman. Because he did miniatures, small boomerangs and spears and shields. I've got some, my son uses them in his school activities. I thought, well, Ted, why are you making such small items? He said, well, I met this German bloke who wanted to buy my product, but it was too big. He said, could I make them smaller and not lose the integrity of those items and the craft because we could put them in people's suitcases to take home? So Ted was a bit of an entrepreneur. And there's lots of those people out there that we need to tap into. I heard a speech the other day that said it was a, art, Aboriginal art was being used for a, a white system. Brothers and sisters, if you can make a dollar out of it, let's do it. Tan, Tan Daniel was established 
to be a focal point, and it should remain a focal point for South Australia. It's an important location for performing and visual art expression. There's been an interest, an increasing interest in performing art groups, and they're going all over the place. Many have gone overseas many, many times performing, and it's great to see people like Jack Buckskin and uh, the young fellow who won the prize today, you know, with uh, singing. Because contemporary music has produced some equally talented performers. The contemporary art movement is healthy and new people are attracted to take up the brush and paint to tell their story. But we need to be careful to ensure all of our artists are able to be supported in the marketplace. Any new development must provide a space and room for groups to organise and control the decision about how to market the art and develop the performing arts. This is an opening, in my opinion, to create a space for artists to use the studio space, to build skills and produce product for the marketplace. It's a critical issue to grow the contemporary expression of our story of country, personal stories and the history of Aboriginal people by encouraging visual performing artists, contemporary and traditional, to make a connection with agency groups, the commercial sector, and provide easier access to resources. There is a need to put in place an interface which is for groups and individuals to build an enterprise platform. The history of Aboriginal people is that we want to tell our story and we have to give that some expression. The history of Aboriginal people is a story lost in many cases because we failed to record the personal memories and experiences of our people. And this is driven home to me by the experiences that I had in the past. But I want to just pause here and acknowledge the Aboriginal Family History Unit at the South Australian Museum. It's a testament to the determination of one extraordinary woman, Dr Doreen Katinuri, who was the driving force behind the unit's establishment. Dr Doreen Katinuri was an activist and a historian. She was amazing. She started work, I think, at about 14 as a domestic, but in the end she published 10 books. Doreen researched and recorded the histories and genealogies of Point Pierce and Rauk and Aboriginal families. She was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Adelaide. She was named the South Australian Aboriginal of the Year in 1994. The Aboriginal Family History Unit at the museum is an important unit that has worked to assist many of our families uncover their family history. And I was with Frank Lampard and I were with some 500 young people at STEM conference for the last two days. Um, and the Congress, we uncovered kids who, one young fella brought in his Adyamatna big book of his family genealogy and we tapped him into going to the history unit because he can't make the connection with his dad's history. The history of each family group in South Australia, we need to ensure that they have a record to share with future generations and build skills amongst our own people to author their own publications. We've got to stop getting other people to write our story. We've got to write it ourselves. We need to remind ourselves there are many stories we didn't record because it was seen as not that interesting. And my sister Gwen, she was my sister-in-law, but in our way we don't call people sister and brother-in-law, not from where I come from, they're sisters or brothers. My sister Gwen was a living library because she had grown up around her own cook of the elders and she had a good command of the language but none of us worked to record on paper her library in the mind. When I decided to write our family book, A Bush Beginning, only four of the nine of our family remained to recall the story of the family. The other issue is convincing people to tell you their story. My auntie would always say it was their struggle, she was part of the stolen generation, it was their struggle and experience. They didn't want me to become bogged down with the past. Charles Perkins famously said, 
can't live in the past, but the past lives with you. The record of the life of people is in their head. I spent my time travelling with the late Rex Stewart through his Arabunna country. And the experience was one that opened up the story of country as Rex told me about his and his father's story of country. The country started to talk to me in a way I'd never experienced before. As he spoke about places of importance and sites which were significant to the Arabunna people. Never found out if anyone recorded Rex's story. Another ex enjoyable exchange was my many talks with Dr Archie Barton. Archie was an encyclopaedia of the mind. You could talk to him about a date and he'd remember the weather. And then he could get down to the detail of who spoke about what. Our respective journeys over many years in meeting and talking one-on-one -on -one has meant we've been able to enjoy a rich weaving of stories with a cross-section of people in our state. I recall how important gathering places were and how important they were to the people's well-being. Mrs Wilson down at Lower Murray Nungas Club provided a venue. She was a matriarch who you didn't get in the way of either. But you could meet there formally as we did as workers, but we could also meet with people just to have a yarn and a cup of tea. Agnes Rigney was another person who did the same in the Jerry Mason Centre at Glossop. Venues for rebuilding confidence and a sense of Aboriginal place and unity are needed in today's Aboriginal community. Why do governments defund them? Why do they defund them? Are they afraid that people might get some strength out of that journey? The Aboriginal Advisory Committee at the museum is concerned about the preservation of 30,000 items of Ab Aboriginal um, artefacts and important materials. 30,000 items. They're kept in a tin shed. A shed that leaks. And when some of us spoke up about this, we were told that we over-exaggerated. But you can imagine the Unamu doors, very, very prized pieces of cultural heritage getting rained on. Valuable art that had to be stretched because it was soaked with water. The first Premier in South Australia to visit that collection is the man who's in power today. And we're very grateful to the Premier, and I'm crossing my heart, whichever way we went, we had two bob each way, to the main Aboriginal MPs that were going to become ministers, we've got one of them, you know, Ken White, an old friend of mine uh, from years ago. But they visited the collection and were astounded. Everyone who visits is stunned by the size and history in that collection. You as South Australians need to be proud of the world's greatest collection. But it's in a shed. Only 5% is displayed in the museum. We need a permanent home for that collection that's secure and safe from potential damage. And I'm glad to say that the government has supported the commencement of a caring of that collection. If you go away from tonight, go away with an appreciation that you need to talk to your local MPs about what they're doing about that collection, because it's so important. Because it's important that we get it to lot 14 in the new centre so that we can have community research and teaching of our young people about the skills required to conserve that collection. Lot 14 is important as an opportunity to talk, explore and share to achieve a central theme of reconciliation, unity. The challenge for all the parties have an interest is to come to one table and agree to use the substantial collections of the art gallery, 
state libraries, state records, botanic gardens, the museum and universities in support of Aboriginal people being able to provide a powerful reflection of South Australian and Australian history and story of country. The reconciliation barometer concluded that almost all Australians, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, think the relationship is important. I remain optimistic, but the shadow hanging over our desire for relationship building is a level of trust continuing from the survey to being stagnant. It stayed the same for a considerable number of years. There are gaps in the trust that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and non-Indigenous people have for each other. Only 26% of Australians have a relationship with Aboriginal people. We've got a job to do to close that gap. 51% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people believe that Australia is a racist country compared to 38% for the general community. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and 90% of Australians in the general community feel our relationship is important. That's why you came tonight. You believe our relationship is important. Pride in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures is increasing amongst Australians. That's one great sign. And being with those young Aboriginal people to, in the last two days, I was actually, actually knocked off my feet when I went home. They're really bright, smart young people. What a great future. Lois O'Donoghue delivered the Australia Day speech in 2000. And that was the year, Lois, that we went over the bridge and in Sydney and around the country. But I want to repeat Lauch's words in, from 2000 for 19 years later, because I still think they're relevant. And I quote from her speech. It's still the case that many people believe that what happened to our people happened 200 years ago. And as such, it should now be put behind us. It's implied that to talk of the consequences of white settlement is to be negative, to be clinging to a black armband view of history. Sadly, these perceptions are fueled by some of the most prominent leaders of our nation. And in economic times, when many people are experiencing hardship, damaging and divisive myths are perpetuated and become taken for granted. Myths such as people having difficulties have only themselves to blame. Or that anyone can succeed simply by wanting to. That winners deserve to win and losers lose. What many of our political leaders have failed to understand or chosen not to acknowledge is that the racist policies and practices of the past continue to affect every aspect of every Indigenous person's life. The past is still with us. It was said by a guy called O'Neill that there's no future for Aboriginal people, only the past repeating itself over and over again. I want to be optimistic because I think if we can get the South Australian political, business and general population to convert intent into action based on mutual respect and partnership, we can move to a positive space where Aboriginal people's perspective is respected and valued as, as partners in building a strong, healthy Aboriginal community of people. The wider Australian People must build a relationship with Aboriginal people and remove the colonised mindset. And it's incumbent upon all of us that we work on this together. <laughs>
My view is get rid of closing the gap for Aboriginals and replace it with closing the gap for white people. An Aboriginal presence on Lot 14 will shine a light on the past, demonstrate how we can work together now and forge a path to a future which reflects the true story of country. After my many years of being on this earth, my work's not done. Friends, our work's not done either. Thank you.